UFC Vegas 93 recently wrapped up, and I'm going to recap the entire card. There were some robberies. There was a pretty sick finish for Tyra at the end of the night, so a lot to talk about. Make sure you guys smash the like button if you're new. Subscribe. We're starting it off with the first fight. Ladies went after it. Josephine Knutson got a decision win over Julia Palastri. Some damage was done to her face. She was mounted in the first round. She got a 29-28 decision. Good for her. She pulls through. Palastri was tough. Knutson's not a finisher. I said that all week, and uh, I wasn't surprised that she didn't get a finish here. I don't feel like spending much more time talking about this one, but ultimately, Knutson got the W. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, Melquizio Costa versus Shailan Nordenbeke. This fight can be simply put as Nordenbeke absolutely selling. He wins the first two rounds with a pretty snooze-fest grappling control style, and then he gets choked out in the third round. Costa's jiu-jitsu was better. He found the rear naked. Fight was finished from there. He was getting taken down a lot. He had okay grappling transitions, but nothing spectacular, and uh, he strangles Shailan Nordenbeke to keep his UFC career alive, whereas Nordenbeke might be on the chopping block. He might be getting cut from the UFC. Next fight, Weston Wilson, Jekka Saragi. Um, this didn't make any sense, simply put. Weston Wilson wasn't supposed to win. Weston Wilson didn't seem UFC level. I still don't know if he is. Maybe Saragi is just one of the worst fighters ever. I don't know. In UFC history, not of all time fighting. But Wilson gets an arm bar in the first round. I mean, he's really long, so it makes sense he could throw up submissions like that. Shot for a guillotine early too. But damn, Saragi absolutely sold when they hit the mat. I expected more of a striking fight with Saragi probably hammering Wilson's face. Instead, we go to the floor and Saragi gets his arm caught and he gets tapped out. Massive upset. Wilson was a big underdog at plus 280. Respect to him winning this damn fight. Dude was uh, game on the ground. Good submission for him. Let's keep running. I want to talk about the next fight. Gabriela Fernandez, Carly Judis. Now, I'd have to go back and watch in-depthly and give you a rescore because I won't lie. You know, maybe I wasn't absolutely as tuned in as I could be because I was driving and staring at the screen as I drove on the highway watching this fight. But I thought that Judis probably got a decision at the end. She definitely won the third round. Landed more strikes in the first round. I thought she could have got it. I predicted a Judy split decision. So to hear it go split decision, Fernandez, I was pretty pissed. I'm going to stand on this fight being a robbery decision. Like I said, though, I'd have to go back and do a proper rescore. But do I really feel like doing that for this matchup? No, I'm not going to either. I'll eventually rewatch it, but not today, not tomorrow. I thought Judy's did enough. Judy's is a good prospect, though. I don't care about the result of this fight. I want to see Judy's fight a lot more than I want to see Fernandez fight. This was uh, actually fight of the night, so respect to the ladies getting the extra 50K. I feel like that'll definitely soften the wound of the loss for Judy's, knowing that she's getting a little extra $50,000 for herself. And let's jump to the feature prelim. To me, this was the disappointment of the night because Nate Menes. Almost got tapped out by Jimmy Flick in the first round. And he ends up beating Flick by a decision. I just, I think of Maness as so much more powerful. Seeing Flick survive all rounds, I guess, was an impressive thing. Maybe Jimmy Flick's not as bad as I kind of, uh, I don't want to say give him credit for, because I'm not giving him credit saying he's bad, as I kind of make out that he is. Nate Maness was slick in this fight with the hands. He did some grappling work, too. He pulls off a win over Jimmy Flick. I just, I wanted a knockout. He threatened with submissions too in the fight. Maness is pretty well-rounded. It was a good win in the feature prelim, but I want to jump to the main card. I don't feel like sitting on these prelims long. I want to talk about the next fight. Make sure you guys smash the likes if you haven't. Subscribe too. And uh, listen, this was our main card opener. Adam Fugit versus Josh Quinlan. As competitive as this fight was, I really thought Josh Quinlan deserved the end. I was head-scratching that they gave it to Adam Fugit. I could see them giving the second round to Fugit. I thought Quinlan probably got the first and third. I think Quinlan landed better punches throughout the entire fight. Fugit was attacking with a lot of missed high kicks. Like, are we scoring the arm strike high kicks? Like, is that why he wins the fight? 
because he's throwing up kicks that get blocked by Quinlan. I'm confused in the judges' scorecards here. I am. I thought that Josh Quinlan did enough, even though he wasn't impressive. His takedown defense was good. But you know what Quinlan's issue is, man, is he is so damn tentative, too patient, overly patient. And he absolutely fumbles here, losing to Fugit. I know it was a bad decision. I really thought Quinlan won. Like, I was pretty surprised when they called Fugit's name. I thought it was a clear 29-28 type situation for Josh Quinlan. He seemed to outbox Fugit by a bit. But, like, as I say outbox, I know some of you are like, what, he barely landed anything clean. I'm not saying it was impressive. I'm not saying it was a good fight. I'm not saying it was, uh, you know, knockout punches galore. But Quinlan landed more significant head strikes. And I feel like we have to score the significant head strikes more than kicks to the legs and arms. Like, are, are blocked high kicks getting scored more than clean punches? Weird to me. I really thought Josh Quinlan, 29-28. This was another bad decision. Right now, I got to make a statement. I think that the UFC judging has been very sus in recent weeks. And I hope that things get shored up very soon. I don't like seeing bad decisions, but we had two already on this card. I really thought it was Quinlan, 29-28. And the fact they gave it to Fugit was weird as hell to me. And a disappointment, because I thought as bad as Quinlan looked, he could have got the win. But I guess don't leave it in the hands of the judges and don't be tentative AF. And uh, maybe next time he'll have a better shot of pulling through. Next one was Asu Almabea versus Jose Johnson. This fight went essentially as how many predicted. Almabayev getting this fight to the ground and controlling Johnson. Now, he was unable to lock up the submission. Jose Johnson's submission defense is really good. He's a hard guy to tap out. He's also just freakishly built. Six feet tall at flyweight. I like Jose Johnson a lot. I just question how the fuck he makes 125. That's so damn weird to me. Almabayev's a really good wrestler. And like we knew coming into this fight, if Almabayev can land takedowns, he's going to control. And he's probably going to work for subs. He almost got a couple of rear naked chokes, but was unsuccessful with any major moment for him in the fight. Jose Johnson was game, though. Johnson didn't get completely washed out. He had a couple moments on the ground, but ultimately got out-wrestled by a guy that knows how to plant himself on top and control. He does work for finishes. Like, though Almabayev got a grind-heavy decision win in this fight against Jose Johnson, he at least was trying to get submissions. He takes the back, and he's looking for rear nakeds. So we have to more so credit Johnson's resilience as opposed to saying Almabayev doesn't have good finishing skills. I'm sure Almabayev is going to catch some submissions moving forward. This is a good win for him. I mean, Almabayev's a decent prospect. He's 30 years old. He's got really good wrestling. For flyweight, if you can consistently land takedowns and control, I think it's a pretty positive aspect. Like, there's some savage grapplers at flyweight right now. Like, everybody has a good-ass wrestling base at the top of the flyweight division. It'll be interesting to see how Almabayev fares as he starts to fight better opposition. I think that the fight moving forward here should be somebody in the top 15. Like, he's 30. I don't really feel like waiting around and giving him another unranked guy. Let's give him somebody at the back end of the top 15 next. And let's find out what Asu Almabayev can do against someone with some legit skills. Johnson is okay, but ultimately he is a journeyman. Next fight on the card. Good scrap. Brady Heast and Garrett Armfield. Listen, this was the fumble of the bag tonight for me uh, because I had Armfield as a lock this week and it was not a lock in the slightest. Brady Heast and brought the fire to Garrett Armfield with wrestling. Armfield badly dropped Heastan in the second round. It looked like he was en route to getting a knockout. He followed him to the ground, and then Heastan was able to control from bottom and then garner some time, recover. And then he ends up getting a rear naked choke in the damn third round. He was close to getting it in the first round too. So the jujitsu of Brady Heastan is pretty solid. And another thing that I really have to praise Brady on is his skill improvement. Since the Ultimate Fighter, he's gotten a fair amount better. He's only 25 years of age. Beating Armfield's an impressive feat. And it's also the fact that he stands, got that dog in him. He takes a good punch and he keeps coming. And he can wrestle all night long. That type of wrestling pace is going to wear guys out. And ultimately, I think his toughness and wrestling pace is the reason that he was able to strangle Garrett Armfield in this fight. Because there was absolutely zero quit in he stand. Even though Armfield, he looked en route to a KO in the second round. He stand never gave up faith, was throwing up submission attempts. It was impressive, man. 
He threatened Armfield with multiple submission attempts. Armfield almost with the armbar in the first, and then he stand almost with the guillotine in the first round. It was a really good back and forth in the grappling. Armfield was definitely the better boxer, but uh, you can't just win at boxing, man, especially if you can't stand your feet throughout it all. He stands wrestling was the key difference maker. Next fight on the card was our featured bout of the night, Lucas Almeida versus Timothy Kawamba. I think this was... Aside from Weston Wilson, the biggest surprise of the night. It's the fact that Lucas Almeida beat the fuck out of Timothy Kawamba. It was a one-sided ass-whooping. Almeida dropped him three times in the first round, destroyed Kawamba's eye early in the fight, had him busted up and bleeding. Even though Kawamba had some okay combinations, you could see Lucas Almeida did not feel Kawamba's power at all. And Almeida was so confident to just consistently bring forward pressure. He was moving on him, bump him inside. And then when Kawamba's shooting takedowns, Almeida's defense was really good. Almeida has had some suspect grappling in the past. He definitely has somewhat of a suspect chin in the past. This fight here, there was no issue seemingly. He hit Kawamba's good shots. Like Kawamba hit him with a decent, decent few clean ones to the head. Avoided Kawamba's grappling. And Lucas Almeida beat the fuck out of him striking. His hands look crisp. He honestly looks to me like, I'm telling you, he's a, a poor man's money Moicano. He's the great value Moicano. But it was what was needed here. Great value Moicano is able to get through Kawamba. He looked damn tough. Walking Kawamba down, giving him no respect. Dropping him multiple times, staying in his face all night, putting the pressure on him, not giving up takedowns, and just being 0% intimidated. Had Kuamba circling and moving on him. Lucas Almeida's win was impressive because Kuamba gave Balagioki, who's a good lightweight prospect, a really tough fight, and Almeida looked savage. And what's crazy is Almeida looked a lot bigger than Timothy Kuamba. Even Dominic Cruz on the broadcast table seems like he didn't know that Kuamba fought at lightweight last time. He was claiming that Kawamba was moving up from 135 pounds. But I can see why. Because Almeida looks substantially bigger. I think Lucas Almeida could easily be a UFC lightweight. He decides to cut down to the featherweight division because of his, uh, I guess, savage mentality. But he's got a frame for lightweight. He's a big dude at 145 pounds, man. And his strength and power was very legit. He showed a lot of improvements, and I was shitting on him all week, saying I don't think he's improved since the Daniel Zalhuber fight. Well, damn, prove me wrong, Lucas Almeida. You've gotten better, and uh, was enough to whoop Timothy Kawamba's ass pretty emphatically. Next fight was the co-main event, Miles John, Douglas Silva, Diandraj. This was uh, the key parlay saver of the night with Miles Johns, and then obviously our main event winner too, which we'll talk about afterwards. In a good scrap, Miles Johns pulled through. He did rock Douglas Silva Diandraj a couple of times. When I say rock, I'm not talking about him being on absolute wobbly legs and like approaching a knockout. But Miles Johns landed some good clubbing punches over the top. Andraj did have some good spin kicks in the fight. I'll say Andraj looked pretty game. It was real close at the end of it. Like I thought Miles Johns had done enough to win, but. How this scoring had been throughout the entire night, I was kind of anticipating a Douglas Silva Diandraj split decision. I won't lie to you. But Miles Johns, with solid boxing chops, good wrestling knowledge and defense, good athleticism and pressure, was able to win in a good fight against a longtime veteran in Douglas Silva Diandraj. And this is Miles Johns' signature win. After the fight, he actually made a call out. He said he wants Ricky Simone. I'm actually down to give him the winner of Ricky Simone and Vinicius uh, Oliveira. I feel like Ricky Simone's got the edge in that fight, but then Oliveira will somehow knock him out. But Miles Johns and Oliveira would be a damn barn burner, but I don't know if he's going to get that type of treatment. I know he's on a good run right now, but I don't know if they're going to run him all the way up to Ricky Simone like a legit top 15 slash near top 15 test. In the next one. He's close to it though. Miles Johns is definitely knocking at that damn door. This is the best version of Miles Johns. He's on a four fight win streak. I'm very happy with his improvements. I'm very happy with the win. I honestly saw the fight going similar to how it did. With Johns getting a unanimous decision. And what was a difficult fight. This is my perfect prediction of the fucking night. So I'm pretty grateful for this fight. And good performance from Miles Johns. Over a gritty Douglas Silva D'Andrade. Main event time. 
If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the like button. If you're new, subscribe. This was a knockout knee break. Knee break knockout. So I am confused, first and foremost, with the method of victory being called a TKO, when Alex Perez tapped out after Tyra jerked backwards as he had the back of Alex Perez standing up, forcing Perez to put all of his weight on his right knee and then it collapsing and him tearing something. I don't know if it's a meniscus or an MCL. I'm definitely not an anatomy specialist. I'm not anatomy experts over here. But what I do know is that technique from Tyara was really smart. Because it knocked all the weight on Perez's knee and caused it to pop. I think Tyra needs to keep using that. That's a sick move. That's a move that I don't think I've ever seen before. The way he jerked it was different than anyone else that I've seen. Having the back, being on it, standing, and then jerking Perez down. It was super impressive. Tyara, when he landed the takedown, I got very excited. When he had the back control, the hype built even more. And when he secured the back control, I knew Perez was in trouble. Perez was fighting the hands okay. And Tara was unable to get that submission. Ultimately, he made him tap either way, though. The knee break knockout. Perez goes down and taps out. But I do think Tara was going to get under the neck, even if that knee would have survived. What I want to say, though, is it's very weird to me that the method of victory when there is a tap out is a TKO. Because we have seen submission due to strikes before. Wouldn't this be a technical submission due to injury or submission due to knee injury? Not a KO, TKO knee injury? Is it Herb Dean that discovered that he was injured? Or was it the tap out that discovered he was injured? I would probably assume it's the tap out. Not saying he didn't make a scream, but a scream is also a verbal submission. So I am very fucking weirded out why... Tatsuru Tyra doesn't have a win by technical slash verbal submission or injury submission on his record, as opposed to him getting a KO TKO, which was certainly not a KO TKO. I am going to be Mr. Conspiracy Theory. I think a serious majority of people placing prop bets on this fight played the side of Tatsuru to win the fight by a sub. And I want to see what is it? What is it? What is it? The submission line for Tyra, okay? Value was not amazing. It was minus 105, but I know it was a commonly placed prop. And I guarantee you there was a significant amount of people less playing a Tyra KO at plus 550. He didn't get a knockout. Tatsuru Tyra won this fight by submission. We can call it a knee-breaking knockout for the memes, and that's funny and all, but he won by sub. Not knockout. This is an incorrect call by the commission, and it's very shady because I think a lot of people, because I saw people in the chat complaining that had the prop bet of sub lost money here when I think this, technically speaking, should have been a submission. Now, aside from what happened at the end, I do want to kind of dissect the fight. In the first round, Perez was ripping some decent low kicks. He was throwing some hard hooks, but Tyra had some decent knees in the clinch. He was working good straight punches. I thought his straight right would be successful in this fight, and it was pretty successful in this fight. First round with Perez was competitive. I personally scored that first round to Tatsuru Tyra. I thought he had done enough. I thought he landed some good significant shots. He was extremely slick. Obviously, Perez had to make it more of a brawl to get success in this matchup, and he was attempting to do such a thing, and in the striking, it wasn't a complete washout. Perez had some moments. We get to the second round. Tyra's slickness just looked incredible. I feel like Tatsuru Tyra right now is definitely one of the best flyweights in the world, and I'm very interested in seeing him fight for the belt. His stand-up looked very slick in that second round. Him taking Perez down with the method of trip takedown that he landed was super sophisticated, and this was a very high-caliber win. I believe Tatsuru Tyra <coughs> excuse me, has some of the best jiu-jitsu in the UFC flyweight division. I think he's also got some of the best takedowns and he's starting to really have some of the smoothest striking skills because he's incredibly slick. His shots go beautifully straight down the center and they're so damn quick and precise. I absolutely loved his performance here. I think this was a breakout performance and I know he didn't get the under the neck strangle or the knockout by punches, but he is the reason that Alex Perez got injured and can't fight. It's not like Perez is walking across the canvas and tears his knee. 
Tatsuru Tyra destroyed Perez's knee with that torque pull down that he did from the back position. So that deserves a ton of praise because that is a high caliber technique. The way he had his legs in between the middle and he forced Perez to carry all of his weight on one knee and it collapsed. That right there is a submission right there. That is a badass win. Tatsuru Tyra we should be jumping up and down with joy for him winning because I promise you guys, you are going to be damn excited when the UFC goes to Japan. Now with Kaya Skura also getting signed, the Japanese fighters are on the comeback. It's been a while since we've had a Japanese star in MMA. And obviously the Pride FC was, uh, you know, Japan's home for MMA and really the best MMA organization in the early 2000s in the world. UFC now is the creme de la creme, but it's good to see Japan having a savage in Tatsuru Tyra representing beautifully in the UFC. After the fight, Tyra decided, hey, I'm going to call out the champ. He called out Pantoja. I love this call out. It is a little bit reaching though. Even though he just beat Alex Perez, as much as I personally would way prefer Tyra in the title picture as opposed to the winner of Manel Kopp or Mohamed Mokayev, it's going to be difficult to coordinate. But here's my argument. If Mokayev, right, or Kopp winning takes some damage, they may need more of a layoff. Tatsuru Tyra could be in a position to jump the line. I know you're going to say, wait. What about Amir Al-Bazi? Well, Amir Al-Bazi is also injured and is going to be off for a little while, right? And if you think about it, Brandon Roy Vall would be the only other sensible matchup for Tyra. Brandon Roy Vall and Tatsuru Tyra in Japan for a fight night is a legit-ass number one contender fight that would get me so excited. Steve Ursaig is another match. There's so many good fights in the flyweight division right now. The UFC flyweight division went from one of the weaker weight classes to, in my opinion, one of the most savage because you have killers there. Like, if we think about the top fighters, Pantoja, Brandon Royval, Brandon Moreno, Amir Albazi, Steve Ursaig, Kai Kara France, Menel Kopp, Muhammad Mokayev, now Tatsuru Tyra. You got eight savages and i'm gonna say this tyra's performance against perez was more impressive than mokayev's mokayev was having trouble with perez that's a big accolade tatsuru tyra may potentially jump the line just simply by being available when other flyweight contenders are unavailable but if that is not the case and let's say he isn't the one that's going to be fighting for the belt next don't tell me you wouldn't love to see him and brandon royval that would be fucking epic Absolutely sign me up for him and Brandon Royval. That is one of the most badass top contender fights that can be made right now in the flyweight division. And I think it would be a massive accolade too for Tyra to also beat Royval. And imagine he goes out and finishes Royval. Pantoja last time out didn't finish Royval. He struggled. Royval just beat Brandon Moreno. Tatsuru's in a great position, and I really believe that he is the next flyweight star, and I feel like he is a needed face in the flyweight division. If he can grab that belt, I am telling you guys, it is way better for the sport, and especially way better for flyweight than any other contender at flyweight being champion. And Tyra and Pantoja is a really dope fight too, even if they made it right now against a damn 24-year-old Tyra. Because Tyra's jits is absolutely sick, his takedowns are solid as fuck, and his hands are smooth. He's slicker with the hands than Pantoja, and I can't see Pantoja bodying him on the ground. May turn out to be an absolute war where we find out what Tyra's made out of. I'm assuming he's made out of some fucking steel. Tatsuru Tyra looked epic. Perez, he's going to be out for a while with the knee injury, but he'll have good fights on the comeback. He deserves a lot of respect. Alex Perez is good, man. It's just Tyra, I think he's a different level. Congratulations for that win. Now, as far as the picks, the record on paper sucks because I went five and six, but I'm going to argue some points here. Controversial decision. If Judice wins, we're in a different boat, okay? And then you move up. If Quinlan wins, we're in a different boat. So five and six to seven and four is just two bad decisions away. And that's exactly what happened. So it is what it is, unfortunately. Even though, you know, it was rocky on the prelims. Knutson won, which was a money call here over Palastri. Nordenbeke sold as an underdog. Saragi sold as a big favorite against the underdog, Weston Wilson. Carly Judis got robbed against Gabriela Fernandez. Nate Maness made things right and beat Jimmy Flick. Josh Quinlan got robbed 
loved against Adam Fugit. Asu Almabayev dominated Jose Johnson in a fashion that was expected. Garrett Armfield as the lock absolutely sold. But word on the street is he came into this fight injured. He wasn't at 100%. So that's my excuse. I'm actually telling a fucking complete joke and a lie. I said I was going to do this on the live stream. I'm just hoping that somebody paused the video and said, you fucking coper, you're full of shit. It was a sold lock, though. It fucked. It absolutely sucked, man. I was upset. But it's okay. But it's okay. Because I'm rewriting everything. And it's all good. Because you know what? As we moved up the card, things got better. Not yet, though, because Timmy Columba absolutely got his ass kicked by Lucas Almeida. So I was taking L's galore, and I said, listen, if you guys are down bad and the parlays are all falling apart, parlay Miles Johns, Tatsuru, Tyra, you're going to win. And what happened? Both of them won. Miles Johns, perfect prediction. Tatsuru, Tyra, realistically perfect prediction because he should have won by submission. Knee injury from takedown. Submission, knee injury from takedown, technical submission, knee injury from takedown. My call, Oleg Jacek's arm got broken. They didn't call it a TKO win for Kevin Holland. Oh, but he wasn't in a submission. Very strange to me. I think that because Perez tapped, it's a technical submission due to injury. That is how I would call it personally. But hey, main event picks are back on point with the money call. And then Miles Johns getting it done. Perfect prediction. I can't really be upset looking how good this night ended for myself. If you were also wondering why I was late to the live stream, my brother fought and won earlier today in uh, his boxing fight. So shout out to my brother. He's a savage. I appreciate everybody for tuning into the show and supporting me. You guys are fantastic. Make sure you all smash the likes. If you're new, subscribe it up with those post notifications turned on. Uh, last thing I'm going to say is I do think the new UFC gloves, yes, they may prevent eye pokes in a sense. I don't know. We need more statistics over time. I feel like they're a little softer, so clean punches don't do as much. Like they, They're a little bit a little softer. I don't know. Something's different. Might have been a mistake. We'll see over the next six months when we have some empirical evidence where I can back up these claims. But right now, I have a feeling that these new UFC gloves may end up being a big mistake for the UFC. And they might be costing knockouts. Because you look at this card. Did you see a knockout on the whole damn card? No. There wasn't a lot of knockouts on the last card either. Yeah, there was some knockdowns, sure. But there's knockdowns with amateur boxing gloves. That is soft 10 ounce gloves. You see what I'm saying? So let me know, guys, what you thought. Appreciate you all. Smash the likes on the way out. And if you're new, subscribe. Thank you for watching. Peace out.